Hello friends and welcome to my new video in which I will tell you some amazing stories. But before we begin, please subscribe to my channel and hit the like button on this video. So also, don't forget to write your thoughts about these stories in the comments. Let's get started. The first story is Brotherly Betrayal and the Struggle for the House. I knew my brother had a sense of entitlement, but I never realized how deep it went. Thank you in advance for taking the time to read this. In 2016, my brother went through an unexpected divorce and filed for bankruptcy, though he left his house out of the proceedings. Honestly, it shouldn't have come as much of a surprise, considering that the reason his wife left was because he had cheated on her while she was pregnant with their second child. She did try to make it work for a while longer, but understandably, she couldn't get past it. The girlfriend he cheated with also ended up pregnant, but unfortunately lost the baby. To help him make ends meet, my mom paid for his bankruptcy and provided him with at least $1,000 a month, which basically covered his house payments. Because my mom has poor eyesight, my husband and I help her manage her finances and could see exactly how much she was giving him. That's how I knew the amount was accurate. I never said a word about it, though, because it's her money to use, as she sees fit. To give some context about his long-standing sense of entitlement, when my mom retired, she received a $100,000 bonus. My brother told her he was starting a business and needed $20,000. Even though he didn't have a business plan or any real details, she gave him the money and he bought a truck. That was the entirety of his business. He also helped her renovate her house with the remaining funds, which involved basically demolishing it, ripping out the walls, tearing out the kitchen, and taking up the flooring down to the concrete slab. He even rented a backhoe to dig a koi pond that ended up being nothing more than a big hole in her yard. This was another classic example of his habit of starting projects and never finishing them. As expected, the money ran out and she lived in that state for several years before the house eventually went into foreclosure. She has co-signed numerous car and personal loans for him, many of which he defaulted on, leaving her to cover the debt. In contrast, she only co-signed my first car loan, and I never asked for or received any of her bonus money. When she used to live with him and his family, she cooked, cleaned, and cared for his kids, but he still charged her to store her belongings in the 800-square-foot storage shed in the backyard. He is supposed to pay her back $300 a month for all the money she gave him after his divorce, but he refuses, claiming she might give it to O, her granddaughter. And even if she did, so what? In 2017, my brother urged my family and me to move from out of state and live with him so he could get back on his feet, and so I could save more money toward my goal of investing in real estate. He was practically begging, and while I was hesitant, I hated that my mom was still having to give him so much money. She only had her retirement and social security, and he was taking a significant portion of it. The house itself was a fixer-upper, because, as expected, he had never completed any repairs and had started multiple unfinished projects. For example, his two-year-old daughter accidentally locked herself in her room, and instead of just removing the doorknob, he kicked the door in and left it like that. Our rental agreement included a clause that allowed us to assume his loan if he decided to sell the house, and we would pay him $14,000 in equity. He had purchased the house in 2013, so there wasn't much equity built up. Nine months into our lease in 2018, he lost his job and decided to move out of town to live with his girlfriend, who is now his wife, who owned a house. He didn't have the funds to repair his place and wanted to get rid of it, so he agreed to let us assume the loan. Since we weren't expecting this to happen so soon, I asked if we could delay until 2019 to give us time to raise my husband's credit score and for me to stay at my job for two years. He agreed, and we paid him the $14,000. We had a separate agreement that outlined our responsibilities for all repairs, maintenance, and renovation work, along with covering the closing costs. The renovation was much needed, as it was depressing to live in a house in such a state of disrepair. We completed the entire renovation, which included installing new flooring, repainting the entire interior, putting in a brand new kitchen with cabinets, backsplash, quartz countertops, and appliances, as well as adding new exterior doors and lighting. We saw this as our first real estate investment and I had no reason to doubt my brother. The renovation and loan assumption would give us a good amount of equity in the house, essentially becoming part of our retirement plan. As a side note, my brother is nine years younger than me, in good health, and after losing his job, he started a low overhead business that made $272,000 last year. His wife works as a teacher. On the other hand, I am middle-aged, raising three grandchildren, and my husband, who is older, suffered a stroke 10 years ago. 
two years into our marriage, leaving him paralyzed on his left side and in a wheelchair with DVT. This house is basically our main retirement strategy. In late 2019, after two years at my job, we started the assumption paperwork and were almost finished when the bank stopped the process due to my job change. I had just landed a dream position that would increase my salary by $13,000 a year, but it temporarily delayed things. My brother was irritated but seemed to understand. Since I work in tourism, my new job was hit hard, and my hours were drastically reduced while his business thrived. He agreed to hold off on starting the process again, but as soon as we got the paperwork for the second time, I was furloughed for the winter. It's also worth mentioning that since he lives out of town, he asked me to sign his name on the lease purchase agreement for the paperwork submission, which has now expired, leaving us without an official agreement. This week, I informed him that I would be returning to full-time work and asked him to call for the necessary paperwork. Now, he says he's tired of dealing with this and plans to hire a realtor to sell the house. The kicker is that he thinks he's going to keep half of the profits. We've given him $14,000, paid $1,000 a month directly to the mortgage company for 36 months, $36,000, and covered all renovation and maintenance costs, from tree trimming to roof repairs. He hasn't contributed a cent since he left, and I never asked him to because I treated the house as if it were ours. We have never missed a payment, even though we've relied on my husband's social security and my unemployment benefits during tough times. His attitude is baffling, acting as though I have wronged him somehow. We need the house in our name to use a HELOC for enclosing the garage, as our mom's health is worsening, and we plan for her to live with us. If he sells the house from under us, we would be close to homelessness because housing costs in our area have skyrocketed, leaving us with no funds to save. Finding a wheelchair-accessible home would be difficult, and some of the renovations we've made here were to accommodate my husband's needs, like adding a walk-in shower. We also moved here to give my granddaughter stability, promising them they wouldn't have to change schools again. Now, my two oldest grandchildren are in high school and might have to switch, which breaks my heart. We wouldn't even have any equity in a new home and wouldn't be able to accommodate my mom. The equity in our current home was meant to provide us with options for funding retirement, such as paying off student loans, buying another property, or starting a home-based business using the large storage shed here. I am devastated by this situation. I was an only child for nine years and always longed for a sibling. When he was born a day before my birthday, I was ecstatic. It felt like he was my birthday present. I've always treated him well and maintained a close relationship with him and his children, even with our age gap. It's hard to believe he's acting so entitled. Although I've never been vengeful, I genuinely feel like reverting the house to its original condition before letting him profit from all our hard work. It would be a setback, but I feel like it's all or nothing at this point. I have consulted a lawyer because I'm exhausted by all of this. In a sense, I have already lost my brother, but who needs someone so entitled in their life anyway? Edit. Thankfully, we restarted the paperwork, but despite our credit scores of 804 and 786 solid income, and a history of on-time payments, it still took seven months to reach closing. Throughout the process, my brother and his latest wife harassed us, repeatedly threatened to halt the process, and even made my mom agree not to ask him to repay the $10,000 she had given him for child support after his divorce. This was far less than the full amount he owed. She agreed because she plans to live here, especially since he never offered her a place to stay. In the month before closing, they flaunted their spending on social media, buying a Mercedes wagon, two mini trucks, a car hauler, and multiple pairs of expensive shoes, including $800 Louboutins. The cherry on top was when, just four days after closing, he sent me a listing for a $200,000 two-bedroom condo and asked me to convince my mom to buy it for him in her name because he was leaving wife hash four. I told him I'd speak to her, which I did, to let her know that absolutely wasn't happening. I guess he'll never change. You are indeed in a difficult situation. And this situation with your brother, who has shown himself to be very jealous and ungrateful, leaves you feeling disappointed and resentful. We hope you get good news from your lawyer, and don't forget to bring the following things with you. Before and after photos of the renovation. It is also better to have proof that you paid the mortgage and proof that you paid the maintenance costs. This will help your case, and we hope you find it useful. Also, I think it's time to have a frank conversation with your mom. When he asked your mom for money, you didn't say anything and left it up to her. But now that he's trying to steal from you, it's your problem too. If she continues to give him money, she is supporting someone who is stealing from you. 
I know you may not like it, but your brother is not worth your time. The next story is called 911. It was supposed to be a perfect day. After weeks of preparation, the backyard was finally ready for a small pool party with my friends and family. The pool was spotless, the sun hung in the sky like a perfectly cooked egg, and I had hired a local caterer to handle the drinks and snacks. It felt like the soundtrack to a perfect summer day was playing in the background. But of course, Karen had to ruin it. Karen, who lived three houses down, was the self-appointed enforcer of the Homeowners Association, EHOA, in our community. She had a remarkable knack for finding problems where none existed, whether it was my trash cans being out five minutes too early, or the paint on my mailbox not being the exact shade of beige specified in some obscure HOA guideline. Karen always had something to complain about. A week before the party, she had cornered me with a fake friendly smile, making passive-aggressive remarks about the potential noise levels. I assured her we'd be done by 8 p.m. and that there wouldn't be any wild antics. She gave me her signature tight-lipped smile and walked away. I thought that would be the end of it, but little did I know, she was already plotting her next move. The party kicked off around 3 p.m. and everything was going smoothly. We had about 15 guests, mostly family, and a few close friends. The music was at a reasonable volume, and the occasional splash from the pool was the only other sound. I was in the middle of devouring the best shrimp skewer I'd ever had when I heard the sirens. The caterers had just set up a small buffet. At first, I thought it was just an ambulance passing by, but the sirens grew louder and stopped right in front of my house. My stomach dropped. I abandoned my skewer and rushed to the gate, just in time to see two police officers walking up the driveway with stern expressions. One of them already had his hand on his holster. For a moment, I thought there had been a freak accident, but then they spoke. We received a call about an illegal gathering at this address. The taller officer said, we need to come in and inspect the premises. Illegal gathering? I was stunned. I explained that it was just a small pool party. No fireworks, no live music, no suspicious activities. Just a few people in swimsuits, eating snacks. But the officers insisted they needed to investigate because the caller had reported dangerous levels of noise and suspected illegal activities. When the police entered my backyard, the party froze. My cousin dropped his drink in shock, and my elderly aunt almost slipped on the wet poolside tiles. It was embarrassing, to say the least. The officers searched the entire area, even opening the coolers and sniffing the soft drinks, as if I might have hidden contraband under the ice. It didn't take long for the officers to realize the gathering was exactly as I had described. Nothing illegal, nothing out of the ordinary. Just a few hamburgers, some kids laughing, and adults relaxing by the pool. They apologized awkwardly and left, advising me to be careful with neighborhood rules. I knew immediately who had made the call. There was only one person petty enough to make such a ridiculous accusation, Karen. This was her way of asserting control over our little suburban oasis. I was livid. This was the last straw, but I wasn't about to settle for a simple confrontation at her door. No, I had bigger plans. I started by filing a Freedom of Information Act request with the local police department. A few weeks later, I got the 911 call records. Bingo! There it was. Karen's voice, posing as a concerned resident and exaggerating wildly about loud noises, suspected drug use, and even a fight at my house. Her lies would have been funny if they hadn't resulted in police storming my peaceful pool party, but catching her red-handed wasn't enough for me. I dug deeper and discovered that calling 911 for non-emergencies was illegal. Falsely reporting an emergency could result in hefty fines and, in some cases, jail time. I took this information to a lawyer who specialized in HOA disputes, and after a quick consultation, we decided to press charges. Karen was served with a notice for a hearing. When word spread that she was facing legal action, she tried to rally support from the HOA, portraying herself as a victim who was just trying to keep the neighborhood safe and peaceful. To my surprise, some board members initially sided with her, saying I was overreacting. That's when I brought out the big guns. I hired a private investigator who uncovered several other instances of Karen making false reports, not just to the police, but also to the HOA. She had a pattern of using fabricated complaints about dangerous dogs, code violations, and exaggerated noise issues to manipulate situations to her advantage. My lawyer compiled all of this into a thick dossier that we presented at the hearing. 
Karen sat there with her fake smile, trying to appear composed, but I noticed a nervous twitch at the corner of her mouth. As the evidence piled up, her tight-lipped smile began to crack. By the time the recording of her 911 call was played, she was visibly sweating. The HOA board was stunned. Several members who had initially supported her quickly distanced themselves. One even murmured an apology to me after the hearing. The outcome was better than I had hoped. Karen was fined heavily for misusing emergency services, and since this wasn't her first offense, she was also hit with a temporary restraining order preventing her from filing any HOA-related complaints for a year. In an effort to distance themselves from the scandal, the HOA issued a formal apology to me and promptly removed Karen from her position on the board. But the final blow was something Karen didn't see coming. My lawyer suggested I sue the HOA for damages, citing emotional distress and the public embarrassment of having police raid my home. We went ahead with the lawsuit, and rather than face a lengthy court battle, the HOA decided to settle. They agreed to cover my legal fees and updated the neighborhood rules to require a more thorough review before escalating any complaint to law enforcement. Now, I sit by my pool with a cold drink, enjoying the peace and quiet, Knowing that Karen and her petty tyranny have been dethroned, the neighborhood feels like a better place, and even my mailbox seems a little brighter. No one has dared to complain about it since. The next story is, congratulations, you have a strike and a ban. Most of my co-workers at the bowling alley where I work in a college town attend the nearby college or local high schools. I'm lucky to have managers who support us when customers are unreasonable. Typically, they allow us to enforce a three-strike policy before ejecting someone. I was still new to the job when a man and his son came in and started being rough with our equipment, stepping onto the lanes, and even chipping a ball after jumping the gutter. I politely explained the rules to him each time he broke one, and by the fifth time he asked, Do you know who my wife is? Me. Your wife's status doesn't change our company's rules. If you step onto the lane like that again, my supervisor will be escorting you out. EC. If you go to nearby college, you won't want to do that. Me. I don't. I didn't. EC. She's on the board there. He said this with a smug expression, clearly expecting me to back down. Me. That's nice. I was trying to be diplomatic, especially since I'd only been at the job for a month. My manager was known for her no-nonsense approach with customers, so I was doing my best to mediate and soften what she would have said. If you retrieve your own ball again or hit the lane sweep, you're getting kicked out. EC. No, I'm not. I paid for an hour, and I'm going to play for an hour. I'll make sure you lose your job, too. He was implying I wouldn't be able to attend the local college, which didn't bother me since I didn't like it anyway. I shrugged and called my supervisor. S. OP has told me a bit about what's going on. EC. Good. I want a refund for our wasted time, and I want that employee disciplined for needlessly bothering me. My wife is on the college board, and I can't wait to tell her about this. S. You know I was just at the counter, right? It was only five feet away. I'm afraid I'll have to ask you to leave. EC. I paid to bowl. You explained this to my son. His son was about six years old. S. She knelt down to the confused boy and said, Your dad isn't following the rules, so I'm afraid you can't play anymore until he apologizes to the nice lady who was helping you. EC then flew into a rage, hurling insults and profanity saying my supervisor wasn't really in charge because she looked like she was still in high school. She was. He demanded to speak with someone higher up, even though my supervisor made it clear she was the highest person on duty. The general manager's younger sister, who was working that day, recorded the whole incident since it was happening right by the counter. The GM, who is about a year older than me, arrived soon afterward and told EC that he was no longer welcome and had to leave. He added that he hoped EC's wife would hear about the incident. EC then accused the GM of lying, saying he was too young to be a GM because he didn't even look 30. He continued threatening us, claiming he was friends with the owner and that we would all lose our jobs for how we handled this. We had to threaten to call the police before he finally left. The next day, we informed the owner, who said, Yeah, I thought we banned that guy. He broke lane 16. Edit. We've started keeping a list of people who aren't allowed to bowl anymore and have been training on checking names against IDs. The owner assured me he would take care of the situation. Honestly, I'm relieved to wash my hands of it. I don't get paid enough to deal with that kind of nonsense. Even when he tried to use his status or influence, you remained resolute and did not allow him to violate the rules of your institution. Haha. <laughs> but this story has a great ending. Please sign. We don't care who your wife is. Banned means banned. 
Thanks for watching. Just a reminder, subscribe, like, comment. See you soon.